Crystal and Sager over at Breaking Points, and of course, full disclosure, as you all know, Crystal is my wife, so I'm a little biased in these segments here, but nonetheless, I think the commentary I'm about to deliver is fair. They interviewed Vivek Ramaswamy, who's of course running for president. He surged in the polls recently on the Republican side. He's now tied in some states with DeSantis. DeSantis slipped all the way to 12%. Vivek surged to 12%. So here we are. So he's having a little, you know, a little moment in the sun here. He's enjoying it. But uh, Crystal and Sagar did a phenomenal job grilling him on policy questions. So let's watch and we'll break it down. One of the more controversial things that you put forward is a proposition that to be able to vote under the age of 25, you would either have to serve in the military or to pass a test. Why, you know, a decent portion of the people who are watching the show, uh, you do a lot of online shows, are actually below the age of 25. What is the case to them to deprive them of their right to vote con uh, under the U.S. Constitution? Let me, and first of all, this would require a constitutional amendment. So you're absolutely right mm -hmm. that the current constitutional state of affairs, this is not something that I'm talking about, is a law. Let me actually share with you, Sagar, this has been distorted many times over, what the heart of my proposal actually is, and then build into that. Nothing you said okay. was inaccurate, but let me get to the heart of the motive. What I've said is every high school student who graduates in this country should have to pass the same civics test that our, each, each of our parents, I'm going to presume, had to pass yes, in order to become citizens pass, yes. of this country, right? Every immigrant has to pass in order to become a citizen of this country. I think... I'll stand by and wait for a good argument. I still haven't heard one for why high school students in this country, when they turn 18, should not have to know the same things about the country that a naturalized citizen, we demand them to know as well. Mm. And so now let's talk about actually a legal structure we already have. Age 18 to 25, young men in this country have to already register. You did it, I did it, I'm sure. Yep. Selective service registration on pain of criminal penalties. You have to register for the draft. I've said that I would actually decriminalize that. I don't think that's the way we should do things in this country. But in return for decriminalizing the selective service mandate for men in the age of 18 to 25, I've said we need to instead tie civic privileges to civic duties as our founding fathers envisioned. We live in a constitutional republic. That means something. It means our civic privileges come with civic duties attached to them. That's what our founding fathers envisioned. And that's part of what I think we need to revive. And so I've said that, yes, I believe that at least when you're age 18 to 25, that same window where we have selective service mandates today, you at least have to pass that same civics test that an immigrant has to pass, or else tests aren't for everybody. At least serve the country in some minimal way, military or first responder role. And Let I'll me... tell you what I expect to happen. Voting rates are very low in kids mm -hmm. in, in young people among the ages of 18 to 25. I think they will skyrocket once we actually make the act of voting mean something. And I think that's actually going to be an important part of our civic revival in our nation. Let me flip it around then. There's been a lot of discussion around Joe Biden's cognitive ability. Should there be then a maximum age to vote and when people do lose their cognitive ability? Like if we're going to have some sort of test in place on the lower end, should we not have them in place on the higher end as well? So my view is this is not actually a vision for just applying it to young people. This mm. is a vision of what I think should be a civic requirement for really every citizen, but we have to start somewhere. And so I don't believe in somebody who's 60 years old taking away something they've already exercised for all their life. But at some point, if, if we agree that this is a good premise, that we want an educated citizenry that lives out its civic duties, feels that sense of civic duty as they go to the ballot box and live their life as citizens, then we're starting with a clean slate that ages into it with people yeah. who age into being citizens first. I mean, That's the I'm way just, I look at it. I'm just going to be real with you, Vivek. It seems yep. to me like a way to get a group of voters that don't tend to vote very Republican out of the electorate. That's what it feels like to me. Of like a fancy, you've criticism. articulated very well. You know, it's very like civic based, et cetera, et cetera. You use a lot of good language around it. But it seems very convenient that this group of voters is probably not going to vote for you or Donald Trump in very large numbers and are more likely to show up for Joe Biden. Crystal, let me let me see if I can convince you of, of my motivation. Yep. I understand. And you don't that's need a to convince me. I'm just yeah. one that's voter. A reasonable, that's a reasonable, Chris, but, but just yeah. for fun. Uh, he's smiling. He knows he's caught. He's like, okay, yeah, that kind of is the idea. Look, this whole conversation that we're having here is crazy. It's crazy. We've had poll tests before in this country. We've had them. Go read the history of poll tests. The whole purpose of it was voter disenfranchisement, in that instance particularly for minority communities. That was the whole point. They pretended like, oh no, this is about high-minded civic duty and learning about the country and oh yes, this is very basic stuff that we're doing here. Wrong. That wasn't the point. Because Who's going to administer the tests? What are their biases? How do you come up with a perfectly objective test? Why are we even having this conversation when the whole idea of voting is it's supposed to be a right, not a privilege? You shouldn't need a permit. Permit it comes from the word permission. You shouldn't need permission to exercise rights. The whole point of a right is that it's off the table. It's not subject to this kind of restriction and finagling that he's trying to do. But nonetheless, he's trying to do it. So let's hear out his endless rationalization here. Here's what I would say. 
First of all, if that were the case, I wouldn't say it now because I don't have an ability to change that in the election that I'm actually running in, right? Mm -hmm. To the contrary, I actually, one of the things that I'm seeing in this campaign is more than any other candidate in either side, in either political party, we're going to college campuses. We're confronting people with diverse views across this country, including young people. 40% of the donors to my campaign, we have 70,000 plus donors already, 40% of them are first time ever donors to the GOP and many of them are actually young. And mm. the reaction that I get when I go to college campuses with this idea, Crystal, is at first, yes, it does make people perk up a little bit. But when we <laughs> talk through the justification and talk through, talk through the actual motive, mm -hmm. I'm actually seeing something beautiful we haven't seen in this country in a long time, which is this notion of persuasion, actually. Uh -huh. we, we treat people as though they're animals, that we're, we're bean counters. And we say, well, you guys are in the Democrat camp, you guys are in the Republican camp, you're in the black mm -hmm. voting block, mm -hmm. you're in the Asian voting block, divide people up, vote bank politics. Yeah. There were a bunch of animals that jump up to a bone, like a dog jump into a bone for its treat. No. In other words, people are loving the idea that we're putting more hurdles in front of them when it comes to voting. They love the idea. No, if anything, we should go in the exact opposite direction. We should have automatic voter registration across this entire country. So you don't have to fill out a form. You don't have to do anything. You, just as soon as you hit your birthday, that's it. You're good. You're good to go. That's what we should do. He wants to go in the other direction. And again, the net end result of this is going to be exactly what you'd expect. It's like the whole voter ID debate. The whole voter ID debate is like, how do we find a way to limit the voter pool? Because when we do that, Data shows that helps Republicans. Now, you could say, well, that's a second order consequence of, of what they're doing here. I No, I think that's first and foremost in their mind. But even if I grant you that, it's still a bad idea. We are citizens. And what distinguishes us as human beings from animals is that we can engage in open persuasion me, and discourse. And so let me ask you yeah, a little bit about that. Now, this was this big argument. Let me, see if, let me see if I could change your mind on this, Crystal. So like persuasion, bro? Persuasion, bro? Persuasion is like a good thing and stuff. You know what I'm saying? So, oh wow! I'm sure you. I'm sure you changed Crystal's mind. Motivations, but I'm. I'm. I, 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 I'm I can prove it to you. I'm like but you. I believe that this is going to be right for the country. Mm. I'm like you. I'm looking at the data, looking at which party that yeah. this would benefit, and you know that's. But I'm just one person. People can make their own decision. But speaking of the discourse, you know, one thing that I wanted to ask you, I've listened to a lot of your interviews. You know, I think you've gotten a lot of attraction online. You're coming up in the polls. Like I think people really need to pay attention to what you're saying. And when you talk about people who are concerned with climate, you call them climatists. Yeah. You call them climate cultists. You know, let's just put some of these uh, news stories up on the screen here. You've got record high temperatures that are causing increasing death in Arizona. You've got workers who are dying from heat exhaustion. You've got people who are being choked by wildfire smoke from Canada. This is so true. Vivek Ramaswamy likes to do this almost like this Obama-esque language about we have to come together. We're all Americans. Let's not look at the differences. Let's look at the similarities. He says a bunch of stuff like that. But then in the next breath, he's like, you know, we have... Climatists, he considers the, them like cultists, uh, people who believe in gender, he says ideology, gender ideology, those people are also like in a religion or a cult. And then he has one other group that I'm blanking on right now that he, he considers them like cultists. So at the same time, he's like, we need to come together. We need to, you know, not look at the differences, look at the similarities. In the very next breath, he's like, and by the way, all these people who disagree with me, they're uh, idiots and they're in a cult and uh, we need to call that out. And it's like those, you have to pick one or the other. You can't do both of those spiels. Either pick the, I'm going to be incredibly divisive to everybody who disagrees with me, Lane, or pick the, bro, I'm not divisive. You know, I just want to come together and sing Kumbaya. He tries to do both at the same time and is deeply disingenuous. An entire state of Florida that's basically uninsurable at this point. And you know, American people are living this reality increasingly at this point. And an overwhelming majority of them, some, you know, two thirds say, yeah, this is a concern for me. So do you have the, the sort of contempt in your heart for them that comes out in that language when you would describe them as climate cultists? I have no contempt in my heart, Crystal. I have deep sympathy for people who are hungry for purpose and meaning and have relocated their desire for faith to the faith in climate instead. But why? I believe in facts. But what's, I believe in what's facts. wrong with so, this? So we because can talk so yeah, I, I people are experiencing this in their own lives right now. So, Crystal, in any other context, if the people that trust the science crowd were persuaded by lived experience of individuals of something mm -hmm. that's actually a macro phenomenon, you would laugh yeah. them off the stage as a bunch of rubes who weren't data-driven. So wait, 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 wait. The point from Crystal is that not only are people experiencing it anecdotally, the data also backs it up. So before we just had the data. Now we have, there's the data and your anecdotal experience, your lived experience lives up to what the data is showing. That's the point. That was a very weaselly dodge because he knew what she was saying. I've got some data that I can put up data, on, this, on the screen. Uh, Go ahead and put I, the I, next, I, and then I, I want to hear from data. you. Go ahead yeah. and put the next pieces up on the screen. We've got um, some record lows in terms of Antarctic sea ice extent. 
We've got ocean temperatures that are smashing seasonal records. We had just the hottest June on record. I think it might be the helpful for me to lay out my views. Uh, the expectation, because I think you're saying things well, I, I agree with. Please stop hitting me. I'm bleeding. Stop hitting me. Stop hitting me. Because he's like, bro, I care about the facts. I care about the data. I don't care about this anecdotal experience. Crystal's like, all right, here's the data. <laughs> he's like, oh, oh, shit. Oh, no. I, pff, nah, I mean, let me, uh, let me talk, bro. Can I talk, bro? Can I get my views, bro? Tell me what I'm getting wrong here and why this is not something that people should be concerned about and why they're in a cult if they are concerned about it. Sure. So let me lay out some hard facts, both about my views and facts on the ground. Okay. Sure. Are global surface temperatures going up? Yes. Is that likely due to man-made causes? Yes. Is that an existential threat to humanity? There is no evidence to support that. There absolutely positively is, and it's not even a close call. Increased drought, increased famine, that alone is bad. Potential wars over water, places in the world becoming uninhabitable. Massive shocks to the global economy and the food supply. Uh, an increase in, in extreme weather events. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? God, it's so, they've moved the goalposts so many times, the climate deniers, and ironically, even though he's saying people who think climate change is real are in a cult, he's the one who seems to be more in a cult. He swallowed every single talking point from junk scientists who were bought off from Exxon. And the empirical data doesn't matter. The anecdotal experience doesn't matter. He just throws it out the window. Now, by the way, when you show, when you talk to the American people on climate change, the overwhelming majority of Americans say, yeah, this is a problem. We should probably do something about it. So by his logic, what, like 70% of the American public are all climatist cultists? No, they're regular people who are kind of convinced and they're like, hey, we should do something about this. They're not all like Greenpeace activists with septum rings and pink hair who are like blowing up pipelines or whatever. God, he's so, he's so disingenuous. Oh my God. Eight times as many people die of cold temperatures rather than warm ones. This is one of those claims where afterwards I'm gonna look it up and it's gonna to be totally wrong <laughs> or, or completely misstated. But by the way, even if it's not, this is an important point. There's a reason why we now call it climate change and not global warming. Because climate change is a more accurate term. The trend in global temperatures has gone up. There's no denying that whatsoever. But you also have an increase in extreme weather events on both sides of the spectrum. So to give you an example, um, the way that the, the jet stream works and the way that the ocean water in the Atlantic Ocean is circulated, we're gonna talk about this soon too, there's a new story that just came out on it. That is now slowing and eventually scientists say, this is gonna grind to a halt. We're not gonna have the same circulation pattern. And when you do that, uh, you know, England and like the Northern European area, you know, the UK, that whole area, is gonna experience a deep freeze, a deep freeze. But that is directly because of climate change, directly because of it. And it's because of, even though the pattern is, is clearly warming over time, that leads to all these issues on both sides of the spectrum in the extreme. So it's, oh God, he's just, it's like he's smart enough to know this. He's smart enough to know this, but he's he's just, he's the one who's who's got his talking points and he refuses, he holds this, position as, as like it's an axiomatic truth, you know, and, and like it's a tautology, but it's not, and you're wrong, and it's actually dangerous, the talking points you're spewing. Today is more covered by green surface area than it was even a century ago because carbon dioxide is plant food. Plants actually oh, grow in slightly yeah. warmer climates. So actually climate change is good. I've heard this one before. These are all the talking points. Guys, did you know the same scientists today who do the climate change denialism stuff are the same scientists? I believe the name of the group is the Heartland Institute. These are the same guys who sat in front of Congress and said with a straight face, smoking cigarettes doesn't cause lung cancer. It's the same people. A bunch of the same people are now saying, bro, climate change, maybe it's like a good thing or something, or maybe it's not even man-made and stuff, bro. Same people. And he's regurgitating those talking points. The climate disaster related death rate mm -hmm. is down by 98% over the last century, directly attributable to more abundant and plentiful access and use of fossil fuels. So <laughs> I want to be really clear about my view. This is not a, does climate change exist or not? It's the wrong framing mm -hmm. of the question. The question is, what impacts human prosperity, human flourishing in a world in which there are net positive and net negative effects of climate, but also net positive and net negative effects of the use of fossil fuels? I also find it to be a mystery, and it's a mystery maybe you can help me solve, Crystal. Why is it that many of the people who are the staunchest opponents to carbon emissions are also among the staunchest opponents to hydroelectric energy or to nuclear energy? 
I think that that suggests there's well, something else going on. I, I, there's Why been the different shift. standards for China? Let me, let I me think just that say, there's something else going on here. That's my point about well, there's a religious mm -hmm. conviction that goes beyond a commitment to the facts. Let me just say that even Greta Thunberg, who comes in for a lot of criticism as a quote unquote right. climate, climate cultist, is now in favor of nuclear energy. I agree with you on nuclear that that should be more of a push, by the way. If you want to stick but, to Greta, I actually respect Greta but, for one thing. She's uh, honest. She says it's not just about the climate, it's about social justice, it's about climate justice, it's about equity. So these are well, things that at sure, least she is actually an honest statement you're living of what the poor, movement stands for. But also, the idea that if we move to a green and renewable economy and we use that sort of technology for our energy, the idea that that's a drain on the economy and that'll hurt us and that'll lead to less prosperity, nothing can be further from the truth. There's a great argument from an economic perspective that we're trying to get the patents on the next generation of energy and technology. And then if we do that, there's a tremendous amount of money to be made. There's a tremendous number of jobs to be created by leaning into wind power and solar power and geothermal and nuclear and any other potential sorts of things on the horizon. The idea that it's a net drain, no, that's bogus. That's not true. And basically, a lot of these Republican politicians, I can't speak for Vivek personally because I haven't seen the numbers on him, but a lot of Republican politicians are simply bought off by big oil and the fossil fuel companies, which is why they refuse to move in the right direction, even though it would be an economic boom right on the horizon. Sure, you're more likely to be affected by, you know, the toxic plants and bad but toxic, toxic chemical Disagree. plants. Disagree. You're more um, likely to be affected water. by restraints on fossil fuels is actually what you're likely to be affected by. I wonder People if are you dying have because followed, of lack of access to fossil fuels. I wonder if you've followed, though, what's happening in, because, you know, you're, you're a capitalist, you're a successful business guy, so you certainly understand the way that markets work. You look at Florida, you look at Louisiana, you look at Texas, Colorado, California. These are all places that insurance com companies, home insurance companies, are pulling out of because the risk of catastrophic weather, um, extreme weather, is so great now that it doesn't make sense for them to insure in these marketplaces. Florida, you know, and you talk about the human impact, Florida is becoming virtually uninsurable because of the lack of home insurance companies that are willing to operate in this state. So I don't know how you can look at the situation right now and say that, you know, there aren't already extreme costs being imposed on people, not to mention workers who are falling out from heat exhaustion, et cetera. So, Crystal, I don't take my facts on the climate change debate from what the home insurance market is actually doing. In many ways, that's distorted by the same climate cult manifest through the ESG movement. Or they've crushed the numbers. They know they'll lose money because all they care about is the bottom line. All they care about is their money. So they're like, these places are uninsurable because we know there's going to be disasters. We know the sea level is going to rise. We know these people are screwed and we're not going to lose money on that. BlackRock, State Street, and Vanguard are effectively requiring them to behave that way. Why are they doing it? It's because CalPERS, State of New York, and large pension funds have said they won't invest with the large asset managers unless they're signatories of the Climate Action 100 Plus Network. But, That's but let me say on that too. So I, you know, I've written books about this. We can go yeah, into as much depth as you want. Yeah. I know you have, but you, you do know. I mean, on the ESG thing, I have my own critique of ESG that is greenwashing, that none of these companies care about the environment That's or climate or whatever. Um, there, are, there are studies that show that the funds and the companies that claim ESG and they're all about, et cetera, they're actually dirtier than the other companies. So in a sense, you, you've won on that front. But I, Sagar has a question for you. I don't want to monopolize all the time, and I know that you have a limited amount of time yes. for us as well. Actually, my last question for you, Vivek, is on Mexico. Uh, you've talked and been shared a lot of the critique that we've had here on Ukraine about uh, the military-industrial complex, about pursuing things that are not of our strategic interest. But you've talked on your website about using the military to annihilate Mexican drug cartels. I know previously you had at least rhetorically opened yourself up to an invasion. Asian. So, I mean, what are you going to send America's sons and daughters into Mexican territory? What military resources are you going to use? Are we going to declare war on Mexico? How is this all going to work? No, we're not going to declare war on Mexico. My top objective is to get Mexico to take care of its own problems. Sagar, there is a fundamental difference between what's happening with the drug cartels in Ukraine. What's happening in Ukraine does not affect the lives of Americans here on American soil. What's happening with the Mexican drug cartels in Mexico does. So that's just a fundamental difference. Yeah, and the way to address that is to legalize, tax, and regulate drugs and put the cartels out of business in the same way that the problem during prohibition was because alcohol was illegal. You had the mafia and you had criminal enterprises making a lot of money and there was violence in the streets because alcohol was illegal. When you legalized tax and regulated alcohol, all of a sudden the extreme social ills around alcohol, the worst ones, the criminality was reduced massively. Yes, you still had some people who, were, who are alcoholics who are addicted to it. That's called the price of freedom. By the same token, same thing with drugs. You could, you could open a rehabilitation centers and try to help people if they have problems, but the real answer is legalize tax and regulate drugs to put the drug cartels out of business, which is something you wouldn't entertain even at all, even a little bit. You'd rather do a military solution, even though we've been waging, oh yeah, what's it called? A war on drugs for decades now, and we have dick to show for it. We've wasted trillions of dollars. We have dead bodies piling up everywhere, and the cartels are stronger than they've ever been before. Absolutely, I don't want to. De declaring war on Mexico would be a boneheaded Wait, idea. You, you I'm do not say do on so your, what I would do. Uh, on here's your website, though, on your website, you do say, use our military to annihilate Mexican drug cartels. 
So what yes, does that mean? Mexican drug- <laughs> you got caught speeding hard. I wouldn't do that. That's a boneheaded idea. Well, here's your direct quote where it says, we should do that. <laughs> oh, Vivek. Oh, God. Those are as much of a threat to the sovereignty of Mexico mm-hmm. as they are to the United States. They're more of a threat to the sovereignty of Mexico. So here's what I would do. I said that I would use it. Here's what I would commit to doing. Use our military to secure our own southern border. The wall mm-hmm. has been insufficient. Cartel financed tunnels built now underneath that wall. Trucks can drive through them. And then I would work with Mexico diplomatically to say that, listen up, for a f- tiny fraction of the amount we've already spent in Ukraine as of this date, we can help you solve your own problem and regain your sovereignty. There's a presidential election in Mexico. I think it's an important one in 2024 as well. Thankfully, AMLO is going to be out. Hopefully, new leadership. <laughs> What's Amlo's approval rating? It's like 60, 70 percent, something like that. He's like, oh, this guy sucks, man. Yeah, because he does some base things for the for the uh, for the middle class and the poor in Mexico. Embraces not the hugs, not bullets strategy that he has. I think it's been a mistake. I want to actually help Mexico solve its own problem because that will help us. But All as right. a backstop. Yeah, he, he wants to help so much that he wants to, he's threatening to militarily invade them, even though they said piss off. Yeah, that's he wants. He should care so deeply about Mexicans. I know. Don't solve the problem. Then we're going to have to solve our own problem. So wait, so and that's the way I expect to stand. Mexico will solve its own problem. Wait, so but what does that mean? What does that mean? Are we talking about drone strikes on cartels in Mexico? Are we talking about cruise missiles? Are we talking about boots on the ground? If Mexico says we're not working it means with you. We have military on our own border and there are a series of steps we can take. Turn off foreign aid of any kind to Mexico mm-hmm. or Central America until our border crisis is solved. There's a series of steps to take. And I'm convinced that we will never get to the place of actually having to use war of any kind in Mexico. But at the same time, we have to demonstrate our strength to make sure that Mexico is taking care of its problem in a way that AMLO is absolutely not doing based on the posture but that I, Biden's I just taking with be, respect to them. I just want to get a really clear answer. Is there any scenario under which you would use the U.S. military against Mexico's wishes to go into their country and drop bombs, drone strike, or whatever cartels? I will not rule will out that, that we would. Ha- I would not rule, rule out that we have okay. to oh, use that we may treat Mexican it. drug cartels in the way we treated ISIS as terrorists in another country that are posing real risk to Americans, and the risk to Americans is even greater from the Mexican drug cartels than it was from ISIS. That's what I'll say. He admitted it. Credit to them for pushing him over and over and over and over, and he finally said it. Look, I wouldn't rule out military action. Okay. All right, we got you. You're on the record now. We appreciate it. I'd love to see a poll on what percentage of Americans agree with that. Are we talking about 20% is the high number? Is it less? Is it 8%? What are we talking about here? Again, credit to them. They kept pushing him. He buckled. He said it. And now we know. And that's a that's a, a great moment. for him. I'm just, Bro, war with Mexico? That's a boneheaded idea. I wouldn't do that. Okay, but you said here you'd do it. I wouldn't really do that. I maybe do some things that might be short of that, but kind of like that, but not really that. Okay, but it says right here that you would do it. So are are you saying you'd do it? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'd maybe do it. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate that. Hey, y'all, do me a favor and like and subscribe. It helps out big time in the algorithm. Click the bell as well for notifications when videos drop and watch that video on screen right now. You know you want to.